All right, you're live. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Gwen Whistler. I'm the chair of the Planning and Economic Development Committee, and I'd like to welcome you to our March 8th meeting. All council members and staff are participating virtually. To help our audience follow along, I'll state each section of the agenda aloud. We are streaming live on our virtual engagement hub, which is accessible through the virtual engagement hub link on the front page of the city's website. We also have an option for the public to listen <clears throat> live by phone by dialing 855-925-2801 and entering the code 8187. For those of you out there today with us, welcome. For today's meeting, we have the option for people to call in and comment live during the meeting. To call in and comment, use the same number, 855-925-2801, meeting code 8187. Your phone will be muted and you will hear the meeting live. At this point, callers will hear. For more options, press star. Pressing star three will allow callers to continue to listen live and join the speaker queue. If you are watching the meeting through the live stream while you are listening to the meeting by phone, please be sure to turn down the volume on your device before speaking. Okay, I'll now go through and introduce all the committee members and staff who are participating virtually. Please make sure to keep your microphone muted if you are not speaking. Council and staff, as I call your name, please say a quick hello. Councilwoman Sandra Kilgore. No, huh? Oh, okay, well, give me the high sign. Okay. Councilwoman Sage Turner. I'm here. Hello. City Attorney Brad Granham. I am here. Hello, everyone. Assistant City Manager Kathy Ball. Hello. Planning and Urban Design Director Todd Okalacheney. Maybe not. Maybe later. Principal Planner Shannon Tuck. Hello. Development Services Director Ben Woody. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Site Planning Division Manager Chris Collins. Hi, good afternoon. Okay, great. So the first item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes. May I get a motion to approve the February minutes? I'll move. Good. Are you? Second. There you go. We heard you, Sandra. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So we have a motion and a second. We'll, ro we'll roll call to approve the motion um, and second. When I say your name, please say aye to approve the minutes. Councilwoman Kilgore? Aye. Councilwoman Turner? Aye. And I'm also uh, an aye. Minutes have been approved. And then uh, the second thing on the agenda is the revisions to the homestay ordinance. So uh, we're we're going to get an update on the draft zoning text amendment regarding homestays. Shannon Tuck will start us off on this item. I'm gonna, so everybody should mute other than Shannon. Thank you, Councilwoman Whistler and committee members. So the subject of homestays um, is one that's been before the PED on several occasions in the past couple of years. And the last review of homestays and related concerns was back in June of 2019. And the PED members at that time wanted to move forward with a change in the city's definition of kitchen. So to just back up for a moment, um, in 2018, the city adopted a definition of kitchen as part of a larger amendment that it um, dealt with other lodging uses at the time. And kitchen was an important piece of that because it helps distinguish between different forms of lodging. So today, that definition, which is still in place today, um, classifies any space that has any one of the three main components of a kitchen, a kitchen. So if you have any one of those three things, which is a stove, a full-size refrigerator, or a sink, you are classified as a kitchen. So what this meant for homestays, because homestays by definition were part of a home and not a separate dwelling unit, um, it meant that they couldn't have a kitchen. Um, 
This definition allowed them to have what we sort of refer to as a convenience center. So what you typically find in your sort of average hotel room, you know, you might have a mini fridge, a coffee pot, a microwave, things of that nature. That was permitted. But these larger sort of kitchen amenities or permanent kitchen amenities like the stove, the refrigerator, and the sink were not allowed. So PED had heard, well, the whole council um, had heard from a number of members in the community that that was really restrictive. They wanted us to reconsider the definition of kitchen to allow a sink. And in the end, back in June of 2019, the PED recommended that we revise that definition to allow a sink and a refrigerator, but to not allow the stove, to use the stove as that um, defining feature that made a kitchen. Um, and that's where we last, last left off in 2019. Um, but we had a number of other concerns that really were not addressed at that time and remained unresolved. And then this initiative was put on hold for a pretty long spell of time um, for a number of different reasons. And in the months, well, I should say a number of different reasons, not the least of which was this pandemic. Um, and in the months that followed, city staff continued to talk with different community representatives, and we took the opportunity to see if there were other changes that we could consider or even reconsider that would better address these community and staff concerns. So we came up with a slightly revised proposal. So we do recommend revising the definition of kitchen, but rather than just allow the sink and the refrigerator, we're recommending that we consider allowing the stove as well. So one thing that we saw during the pandemic is that there was greater interest in flexibility that would allow these spaces to be used for long-term housing when that short-term demand wasn't there. So it gave everybody more flexibility to adapt to changing conditions, both whether it's personal conditions, like you're in a different life stage and you don't want to rent short-term any longer and now you want to turn into a long-term unit, um, or if it was something more societal like this pandemic. It also helped us with an enforcement challenge that staff was having with stoves because it was a problem we had experienced in the past before we adopted the definition of kitchen. You know, a lot of people would just take out the stove um, to get their home state permit. And then as soon as they got the permit, they would put the stove back in. And, you know, it was something that from on a practical level was just very difficult to enforce. Um, we also saw a lot of people bringing in other kinds of cooking appliances, some of, some of which are probably fine and safe, but others that were more concerning. Um, so we just thought this was easier. It provided that flexibility and it kind of resolved that enforcement issue. Um, the second big change that we were proposing is to require that a property owner participate in the management of the homestay with the tenant manager or resident manager when the owner doesn't live on the property. So when the owner isn't the one running the homestay, living there, managing things, um, they were, under today's rules, really not supposed to participate in the homestay. It was whoever was that per permanent full-time resident was supposed to be the manager of the homestay. Um, we had a lot of property owners wanting to participate um, and just sort of work cooperatively with that tenant. And um, that was another enforcement challenge was sort of, you know, keeping owners out of the picture. It just, again, wasn't particularly practical. Um, and also there was a benefit. So not only does it allow the property owners to participate in the management of the homestay and work out whatever arrangements with the resident manager that they felt were appropriate. It also gave us the opportunity to identify all of the owners on the application and then limit the number of homestay permits to one person or household, LLC, trust, or legal entity. So how this would work is you would apply, you would have both the resident manager identified as one of the hosts and then anybody who's listed as a property owner would also have to be an applicant or a co-applicant. So you could have one or four, it doesn't really matter. And if it's an LLC or a trust or corporation, then the uh, applicant would have to identify who the individuals are. We can actually, we have ways of checking that. And if so, if there is a home that's owned by an LLC with three different individuals who are all managing members or um, members of that LLC, then we would have all, we would have those three people plus the resident manager listed. 
And then those LLC members or investors wouldn't be able to get any more homestay permits. So if their name popped up on any other applications, it would bar them from being issued a homestay permit for any of those other properties. So this was another thing that we were very interested in trying to control for or manage on the city's part was to uh, limit the opportunity for property investors to um, be able to just kind of install a resident manager in you know any one of their multiple properties and get a homestay permit because everybody was working out these sort of backdoor deals with that resident manager and they were benefiting from it. And so this was just a way to kind of get it out in the open and then to better control it moving forward. And then the third major change was prohibiting the use of detached accessory structures as a homestay. This would, um, we had a couple instances where people took accessory dwelling units or detached accessory dwelling units and sort of disassembled or deconstructed the kitchen so that it, it redefined it as no longer a dwelling unit, but rather just a detached accessory structure, which then allowed them to use it as a homestay. We didn't really want people um, using these spaces that were better suited for long-term living um, you know, to, to be able to convert them either if they were not yet designed or upfitted to be a dwelling unit. Um, well, let me, so if it was a dwelling unit, we didn't want them to deconstruct it, to turn it into uh, a homestay. And if it was not yet a dwelling unit, we wanted to preserve it as an opportunity for uh, a long-term unit at some point in the future because it, Generally, we felt like these detached accessory structures are, are better suited for that long-term um, living. So I wasn't going to go over some of the minor changes unless there were specific questions. I think those are the three main ones, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or um, explore this further um, if the committee would like. Okay. Um, does Do the committee members have any questions for Shannon? I, I have several questions. Um, Sandra, do you have any you want to go ahead? I could derail us pretty quickly because I have some, I have several. Go ahead, Sage. Um, I guess a little background first. So why are we, where did this need to address this come from, from people that are within the homestay, currently have homestays, and they're requesting that they be able to have more flexibility within them? Or did staff want this initiative? How did we get here? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, we, before the adoption of the kitchen definition, we had um, defined, you know, kitchen informally, like we sort of determined, so the, let me back up. A homestay, by definition, is just a portion of somebody's home. So if, if you have a private living space and you have a, a sleeping room, a bathroom, and a kitchen, you are, by, by definition, a dwelling unit, and that cannot be used as a homestay. A homestay has to be space within a dwelling unit. So it's very common in these private living spaces to have the bedroom and the bathroom. It was less common to have the kitchen. And certainly, uh, if you think of a typical hotel, you don't, hotel room, you don't usually have a kitchen. So we, um, so before we had a definition of kitchen, that's how we defined it. So people would just, in order to get a homestay permit for that accessory living space, they would just take out the stove because the common law definition of a kitchen is a place used for the cooking and preparation of food. So they're like, I, don't, I can't cook my food, therefore I'm not a kitchen. So, so that's where we started. Then we adopted the definition of kitchen in 2018 that said, well, it's not just the stove, right? It's the sink and the refrigerator. And if you, if you have uh, any one of those things, you know, you're gonna be a, a kitchen. So really we're trying to make it very clear that all you can have are these sort of convenience amenities. Um, and that is the point where I think the homestay permit, um, people who wanted homestay permits, people who had homestay permits said, you know, that's that's just, that's really hard. You know, we want to be able to have a, at least a sink. It, it's much easier to live without the stove than it is to live without the sink. Because they, we heard a lot of reports of guests like 
you know, trying to wash things out in the in the lavatory sink and causing all kinds of problems and cooking things in the microwave and making a mess and they didn't have a place to clean up because there was no sink. And so the sink was really, really important. Um, so when the PED heard this back in June of 2019, I think I think it's fair to say they basically agreed with that. They said, yeah, we get it. Sink's important. Let's let them have the sink. But we don't want these spaces to be turned into dwelling units. So we're not going to allow the stove. Well, that's where this pause gave us time to kind of explore that and say, what are our biggest concerns? Our biggest concerns are how do we practically enforce this? When I say we, I mean staff. How do we practically enforce this? Um, how do we preserve housing? Um, is it really like keeping a stove out of these spaces or is it really trying to limit the number of investors coming in and um, buying up properties and turning them into homestays? What is it? So it was also, I think, something, you know, I think the pandemic also taught us a lesson that it's kind of nice or it's beneficial to have the flexibility to go between long and short. Um, it's perhaps not perfect solution, but it's something that I think we felt like we could live with and it resolved that enforcement issue. And we focused, then we then turned our attention to these other things, you know, protecting the detached accessory dwelling units and then trying to control the investors. So those are the other two changes. Sorry, um, that's kind of a long-winded. It's story. okay. I think it helps. And I think, you know, there might be some folks watching that um, would like to hear all that again. Um, can I ask Brad a question? Brad, um, in your knowledge, can an LLC be established without the entire ownership being public information? I think that's a that's a good question, and, and let me say that the way that North Carolina handles LLCs is uh, that generally you must file your documents publicly with the Secretary of State's office, establishing uh, who the quote members are. Members are just the term given to ownership uh, individuals within a limited liability company, much like shareholders would be established for a corporation. So you have to at least provide on an annual basis. Um, a list of those members. Now, unlike a corporation that could have many, many stockholders, uh, generally speaking, LLCs are going to be limited to uh, fewer members, and those members do have to register. So you could uh, set up an LLC with uh, multiple agreements in place where someone would have an interest in the LLC, but m the members themselves are supposed to be registered. And there's no limit to how many LLCs one person can be a part of. There, there is no statutory limit in North Carolina on that. Um, I mean, I, so personally, I'll just put my opinion out there. I am very worried about freeing up and creating more flexibility that could impact um, long-term rentals becoming short-term rentals. So I would, you know, I understand this is a long, ongoing conversation. I should actually step back and say, I am a homestay owner. I have a homestay, okay? So I, I feel like that's a fair thing. I have a homestay without a kitchen that has a bathroom with a large sink. In all my years, I've never had a complaint from a guest. Um, so in some ways, I'm coming from a place of experience saying, there's a lot of flexibility in the ex existing um, ordinances and options. And I know from firsthand that it's not actually a complaint that can come from guests. Some people might be getting complaints and I wouldn't know that. But I would like for us to know before we take such a leap, because I've gotten only about 12 emails or calls about this from folks with homestays that would like to have nicer homestays. I'm curious if we know how many rental units, homes, apartments, whatever they might be, we would potentially be putting at risk to becoming short-term rentals. Do we have any idea? Because on the one hand, we're trying to help a dozen or so people, even if it's 50 people, convert back and forth to long-term and short-term. And on the other hand, we have potentially thousands of units that could be at risk. And you know, we know we have an enforcement issue as is. We estimate we have hundreds, if not over a thousand illegal units. And I just, you know, last time we brought this up, I think it was in PED, I'm not even sure, we said, you know, why would we move, make any moves until we had an arrangement with Airbnb to help us work on enforcement? 
and how can we how can we get there before we just create more opportunities for more short-term rentals? And I think we all know we have an enforcement issue. I think we all know we have illegal ish rentals in our neighborhoods. I could tell you about five in my block. And I mean, maybe some examples would help. I have a neighbor with a walkout basement who um, houses an elderly woman who needs to have other family members around or people around in case she falls. Would she lose her apartment? You know, would my neighbors across the street, they keep a, I should say across the street, um, a block over, they keep a um, kind of a personal helping assistant in their basement. And that's their, they help them with the house and that's how they get their rent. Would that person be subject to possibly losing their rental? I mean, you know, these are the risks that I'm trying to weigh because I'm a lot more concerned about the people who are facing housing insecurity, not able to find apartments, seeing it explosive prices. Just Economics is telling us right now prices have gone up $900 in three years or something. And I'm a lot more worried about them. No disrespect to the folks with the existing homestay. I'm worried more about the renters and the people that could be impacted than making sure these few can have a better experience with their homestay. Am I the only one that feels that way? Well, it's a really tough question to answer. Um, I think while the flexibility could potentially displace somebody because now a space that might have been used long term could be attracted to a property owner as a homestay. Um, it also gives people an incentive to create more of these spaces. So while one person may just be displaced, there could be more options for this kind of long term housing out there. Now, how that really manifests, it's, it's hard to say, uh, you know, it's hard to have that crystal ball and know exactly what the outcome might be. Um, it's true. And I was thinking about, you know, in the affordable housing world, we talk about uh, NOAA's naturally occurring affordable housing. So as these new, we you know, tend to beat up these new expensive apartments come on the market, say, well, no one can afford them. But over time, they become affordable because newer things hit the market. So follow me for a second. So now we say, okay, you can have a kitchen, you can have a stove, you can have a fridge, you can have a sink, you can basically be a dwelling unit. And now anyone in the community that has one of these can come apply. Have we just then impacted those folks who have a bedroom they're renting and we're using it to get by? You know, I mean, is there like a, did we just create, did we take our nicest units and give them to tourists leave the lesser quality ones for locals. I'm just really worried about it. I would feel better if we had enforcement. I would feel better if we knew how many apartments and units we were putting at risk. I would feel better if I understood why these folks with the homestays can't be more creative and put big sinks in their bathrooms. I just am a little confused about why we keep bringing this up. But I can, I'll be quiet. I have a long list and I would love to hear from the others because I may just be talking in vain. Maybe there's not support for this and I don't realize it. Gwen, Sandra, any thoughts? Okay. Um, I just wanted to clarify something I was reading. Um, so uh, in section K, Shannon, it says detached structures connected by a breezeway or other enclosed but unheated space shall not be deemed one dwelling unit for the purpose of this subsection. I think what that's saying is like, if I have a, um, if I have a garage apartment and I've got a little breezeway between the house, you know, the main house and the garage apartment. Just because I've got one connection, that doesn't that doesn't allow that garage apartment to be a homestay. Is that right? Okay. Yes. That that I think that wording could be better, but I um, I mean, maybe I don't know. Maybe something like you know uh, to consider it. To, not detached it has to be connected with um under air conditioning or heating or something like that but you you guys i'm sure brad's looked at the word so he's probably saying gwen you don't know what you're talking about but okay uh, go ahead sage just keep going with your i mean i think it's important to you know get your concerns yeah, yeah. It is. Well, and I'm really concerned about this because, you know, on the one hand, we are doing everything we can. Taxpayers committed to $25 million in bonds to build affordable housing. We're saying things on one hand over affordable housing. It takes as much as $80,000 in subsidy to create one affordable household. 
but we'll give away our basement apartments. I just don't get it. Um, personally, I struggle with the philosophy. And I maybe, and this is what I tell the Homestay Network, I mean, Jackson, if you're listening, I've always been, you know, straightforward. If we can get Airbnb to help us or any short-term rental platform, I don't think Expedia is as relevant because they're VRBO and those are long, longer things. Um, but these short rents, these two nights, this is Airbnb's world. If we can get them to work with us on data like they do in other cities and we can call all the illegal ones, I've seen at least five illegal ones this past few days, um, and we could get a better understanding of how much inventory of our housing stock we're putting at risk, I mean, we might have a more success in moving forward. Or maybe we were, we've built a few thousand units in five years and we're in a better state with our housing. I mean, I just don't understand why in a housing shortage, a housing crisis, we call it, we would do anything that could pull income or units from the environment. And I think if the argument is that the homestay user, which is very valid and is true in my case, relies on that income to remain in their home affordably, I totally respect and understand that and live it myself. But this rule has not been preventing me from doing it. So I don't see the need for the rule change. I see it as a risk. Um, and that's really just from my lived experience. Um, so Sage, can I just clarify? So um, from your perspective, <clears throat> um, would you would you be willing to talk? About, I mean, so what your point is is, or let me just ask, um, you would say they shouldn't be allowed to have a stove. I mean, is that your? I mean, are are you okay with the rest of the changes? Like you can have a bigger sink in your, you know, you can have a bigger sink or you can have a little refrigerator, but the stove is the... I don't know. I mean, I don't... At this day, I mean, my kitchenette has a hot plate, a microwave, a convection oven. I don't know what what a stove... I don't know, other than it being like an extra electrical outlet and thing, it's a bigger object, I'm accomplishing the same things. And frankly, these folks don't even really love to cook. They go eat at our restaurants. If, if anything, need bigger refrigerators for it to go. Now, not everybody's the same. I don't mean to generalize every guest. Jackson probably just grimaced. Um, but I don't know about the, it's the whole kitchen, it's the whole unit versus a part of your home. I also have problems with the um, idea of someone acting in your behalf. They're the, what is it, co-host? Um, you know, and I had to explain this to someone just yesterday. And I said, I don't understand because it's really, it's in the name itself. It's the home stay. It's you stay at home. It's the homeowner. It's the, it's whatever, the person at home. Um, I don't think we need people that own these to be somewhere else with third parties managing them. I think what we're trying to do is allow for renters to partake in this environment with the permission of the homeowner which we probably could get at without any of this kitchen stuff. And we also, I mean, I, I just don't understand that one either. And I think um, what I've heard from some hosts in the community is it would just be easier for them. I guess that, I think that's a fair observation. Um, and what, so let me just say like today, we don't allow the property owner, if you don't live on the property, you're not supposed to participate in the homestay but they do. The bottom line is they do. It's just like, just because we don't allow you to have a stove doesn't mean you aren't cooking in that space. They are. Mm -hmm. They're using hot plates. They're using convection mm -hmm. ovens. They're using toaster ovens. So it's kind of, we're trying to trying to get at a compromise that, like I, I think I mentioned before, like we're just trying to kind of get it out in the open. We want you to tell us who is there managing this space, who owns the property, so that we can keep that owner from doing this somewhere else. Like you get the one, you just get the one. So right now we have people who might own five or six or four, or however many properties, and they do this. They install that resident manager in each of those. And then they really, they either charge that individual more rent, um, so they benefit that way, or they're participating without being like kind of in name on the, the um, uh, on the website, you know, they're finding ways around it. So they're, they're, a lot of them are still benefiting, but just in a way that is difficult for us to detect. Um, so we're thinking, you know, but, but we also recognize that 
those resident managers are likely benefiting in some way. They're getting either, you know, it's some deal they've negotiated with the property owner. They get some portion of it. They get um, a break in their rent or they help with um, maybe they get some additional money for cleaning the unit. You know, it just depends. Everybody's doing something a little bit different. Um, and it just kind of, it allows them to continue to benefit and it allows us to regulate those property investor owners a little bit more thoroughly. That's kind of the goal, but we can go a lot of different directions with regulation, so, it's true. Yeah. Um, so. And we and don't that, really have yeah, to that's change, what I, just to be clear, we don't have to change anything. So have, you know, how many homestay permits do we have right now that are active? 144, 144. We have 144 active home state purchases. Yes. That's it. Yeah. And see, and the thing is, the one thing I would say is. That can't be right. Basic, basically, that's legal. That's what I was told. Um, I think it might be like 1,500. I'm not, I don't think it's 140. Really? Uh, but if, if staff forget that. You know what? Chris, you know what? I'm sorry. Chris, it's home on. Days. No, no, no. I'm Chris, sorry. can you clarify this? The yeah. We got 144 was actually full house. Uh, yeah, probably yeah. grandfathered in. Yeah, Home, homestays will be active in the high six hundreds, close to seven hundred. Okay. It fluctuates, but and then we think we have you know as many as a thousand illegal. Um, I'll share this just because it's interesting. I have um, family trying to come visit right now, and they were looking at things. They're too large to stay in my house, and numbers. So they were looking in my neighborhood. They kept sending me like, "Hey, what do you think about this one?" And I went, "I think that's totally illegal." <laughs> they sent me another. Oh, well, that one's illegal too. I mean. The enforcement is so challenging. I don't know how we do anything that makes it a freer market until we have enforcement. And I don't, I'm not blaming any of us because I think the enforcement is so challenging. Um, but if we, I just don't see, like right now with a homestay, we have people telling us they're living in the home and that they're renting a room. And then you go look at their listing and it says it's the entire home. You will have the home to yourself. So they are leaving and they're advertising as such and we can't do anything about it. So now are we giving them whole houses? You know, the ones I was being sent to by family members this weekend, the hosts, the houses are within a half mile of my house, Central City, and the hosts are in other states. So I don't know if that's like co-host, their friends, I don't know, but they're from Texas renting places in West Asheville. Maybe they're the few grandfathered in, maybe they're all illegal. So I, I have so many flags around it that I just don't know how we would move forward. And what I've been telling the Homestay Network is encouraging them who have been able with their power to talk with Airbnb and get them to the table. And Jackson, if you're listening, please continue to do that because I think that's what we need. We need what they did in California where Airbnb is finding and removing from their platform non-permitted homestays. And I just don't see how we do anything until that's fixed. But. That's just me. Sandra? Well, I'm in agreement with uh, Sage on that. I think it's basically, it seems to be a regulation problem uh, that we need to get uh, control of uh, before moving forward with those changes. And, and that's just so because if you don't, if you can't count it and measure it, then you really have no control over it. So uh, for that reason, I would like to see, like I said, uh, a lot of the steps that we're making to actually identify and uh, putting rules and regulations as far as homestays, like she said, homestays should be homestays and it, that's what it should be. And not the idea of having them, you know, managed by someone else because that becomes something totally different. So, and like I said, we need to really work on that part of it. And, uh, and, and then once we can control it and know the numbers, then we can more or less uh, move forward with the changes I think. So I'm in agreement with that right now. Uh, I would love to see it that we get to a point where we're able to allow uh, more, uh, open it up more uh, to the general public. But like I said, I think we just need to take steps to um, put control measures in place. Um, so what I'm hearing is that we don't have consensus to move this forward to council. Um, the, can I can I propose a friendly amendment to that? The the like I'm okay with not suggesting this go forward to council until we get more consensus around it. Um, but can I also ask that we make the change that makes it very clear that homestays do not include detached dwelling units? 
because that is for me a big a big something and apparently it's not clear um and As the accessory structure versus the accessory dwelling unit that right that okay. if it's an accessory structure it can never be a homestay no matter what it looks like um i mean i would just that's the one change for me that i'd like to see put in place even if none of the other things get put in place i remember when it came up and we flagged it because it said basically like if you had a shed like i have a shed in my backyard with a lawnmower in it but it could be a homestay <laughs> so crazy well well but i mean that's your perception i mean you yeah. know you can have i mean you you also can have a garage that you convert it to you know a um you know it, it has plumbing etc in it and people are using those as homestays and or thinking they can be used as homestays and so that's the one thing for me that if we don't do and if we don't recommend anything else to council that's the one provision that I would say needs to be changed. That we just need to make we need to make it clear within the ordinance that um, a detached unit never gets to be a homestay. I mean, I'm, and, and I'll give you an example. In my neighborhood, there's, um, I mean, this garage is farther um, farther from their house, the main house, than it is to the house next door. And so, you know, if somebody's using that as a as a homestay, the homeowner can't hear nearly as much as the the house next door can hear. Um, and so, you know, to me, that's just completely out of the realm of what makes sense. So, so I would, I mean, if we're not going to move this thing forward, I would ask that we ask staff to move that piece of it forward. How does that feel to y'all and staff? I mean, first, Chris, do you have any idea how many of these accessory structures are being used as homestays? And then, Shannon, I'd ask you, how would that feel to move just that one piece forward? Do you feel like it would open up a whole other book of worms and dwelling units? And I, I would say that's, um, from, from an enforcement standpoint, that's one thing that's fairly easy to regulate and manage. Um, so I, I personally wouldn't have any concern about that. There aren't a lot. I think, Chris, you probably have a better number, but I think we what we were thinking, like a dozen or so of these mm -hmm. that might be rendered nonconforming. Do you have a more accurate number? Say higher than that. I don't have a real reliable number for you just so there's not a specific metric we track. Um, but it's not like the majority of them. It's probably a small handful, less, yeah. than, less than 50, I'm really confident in saying, um, but probably far less than 50. So just to but I think clarify, clarifying that because one of the things, you know, when we when we um, relax the rules on um, accessory structures and accessory uh, and accessory dwelling units, we specifically said in that ordinance that it was never to be used for short term rentals. Um, and so, you know, to me, that not being clear to people that they can't use. Uh, detached units as as short-term rentals um, or homestays really violates the spirit of that previous um, uh, loosening of those rules. So just to clarify, uh, Chair, our, our, our as it's currently written, we would propose that the existing ones be grandfathered. And that, that, that we would not allow any more at all to become homestays. And I just want to clarify that that would be your recommendation. And that be, I'm hearing you say that that would be your only recommended change to the ordinance at this point. Is that correct? That's what I'm hearing. I do not, I do not feel that we've got consensus on the board, uh, on this committee. It, um, unless, do I, do we have consensus about the detached unit? I'm with you on that, Gwen. I understand what you're getting at. And how about you, Sandra? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, oh. I mean, and then I guess the other thing, I mean, Shannon, you've heard some of these. I don't, I don't know whether there are little things that are just cleanups that you'd like. 
Yeah, that was going to be my question. That's why I raised my hand. I'll lower okay. my hand now. <laughs> Just there are a few things that we included. If an ordinance is going to go forward at all, I would ask that maybe we include a few of these little things that I don't believe are controversial, like requiring that a, a applicant be a minimum of 18 years of age. Um, I, there's a couple like that that I don't, the Homestay Network didn't have a problem with and I don't think anybody else has a problem with. Um, and we're not really having big problems with those things, but just to make it really clear. Um, and then the other thing that I would ask if the committee would be willing to consider is just making at least a tweak to the definition because today the definition is very confusing around the sink. It was written to try to not um, disqualify somebody from having a utility sink when it was in a utility area. So it used these dimensional requirements. It's very confusing. And so what people are trying to do is find a very abnormally non-standard sink and put it in their homestay. So. I think it would be a good idea to to clarify that in some way. Now, either just clarify that it's not a problem to have a utility sink, but you're not supposed to have these other things, or to add the sink back in um, as the committee had recommended back in 2019. I leave that to you guys to direct. Well, I, well, I, I will say, I will say, I don't have a problem with adding the sinks back, or um, not having the sinks at all, because the sink is what's triggering. Right. We could, right, we could clarify that you can have a utility sink in a utility area, but that the homestay, we could go back to the 2018 definition, which is, or the intent was, was to allow a convenience center, but don't have those more permanent um, kitchen facilities like the sink, oh. the stove, and the full-size refrigerator. So you can have a small refrigerator, you can have the microwave, you can have the hot plate, you can have the coffee pot, that's fine. Um, but we just want to try to stop you short from like turning it into a dwelling, which is now. What do, it now is. do you do you think a, a, a sink would change the complexion of that that much? I mean, I can see how a stove or a full size refrigerator would, but a sink, um, especially in light of what's going on with the COVID and the and the viruses, and you know, not really knowing. I just think it's it's just basically a, a safety measure to have in a homestay, to have access to a sink other than the bathroom sink. Oh, so they do have a bathroom sink, but that, I mean, that's really the crux of what we're talking about. If, provide, if allowing a sink in the unit makes it an actual dwelling unit, then it's not really that we're saying to the existing homestay members, hey, go ahead and have a sink. And what we're really saying is, hey, every other unit in the city that has this makeup, you're now eligible to be a homestay. And that, I think, is the big difference. Um, and I think what we're getting at here, and maybe let me ask this thought, because um, what I hear from the homes, from not just Homestay Network, but from folks with these homestays, is really they are wondering, how can I be you know, more productive and supportive of the things I want to do? How can I go back and forth between long and short term? And I think what we are saying is, or at least what I'm saying is, I'm not ready for long term to go back to short term. But if you have somebody that's okay for short term, how can they go back and forth? And I think these homestays should have a primary kitchen already, right? So they have a, they have a working house. So the homestay could be, is, unless it's got a separate entrance, isn't connected to the other one in some way, a homestay could become a long-term rental just as legally because it has a kitchen in the house. But maybe our tweak is that you don't lose your homestay permit. I mean, you don't actually, you don't, you should be able to go back and forth if you have one of these units that has a master kitchen in the house, even if the homestay is in part of the house. You should be able to be long-term or short-term at your leisure, right? And we right? do. We allow, we don't necessarily, um, if, if you okay. are a homestay permit owner and you want to go to long-term for a period of time, as long as you maintain your homestay permits, we don't, we allow you to interrupt that use, okay. or we, we have historically. We've allowed people to go back and forth. But I think it was the, um, you know, the disassembling of the kitchen and reassembling yeah. of the kitchen um, that was the thing that they were hoping to avoid. And that's why I brought it up, because as if we're going to talk about sinks that are utility size, sinks that are kitchen size, we're talking about plumbing in the wall, sink in and out, whatever, a PVC pipe that's a different diameter. So I still am like, I don't think we should have kitchens, because... What we're saying is that 
it's just one more step towards a long-term rental or a short-term rental for a long-term rental and we still have no enforcement. So to me, it's just, it's all the same question. I think we're trying to make it easier for a small group that's really going to impact a large group. And I, I kind of hate to say that because I think as a, as to the home state folks, you have creativity. You can do this without a full-size sink and it won't impact your income. So I don't, I guess I just don't get the push. And the underlying push seems to keep coming back to taking some of our long-term units and opening them up to short-term. And I'm just not okay with that. Sandra? Well, I, like I said, I'm still a, somewhat um, a little confused is because basically, do we have an idea as to, like she was talking about as far as numbers, as far as how many, how many homestays that are, that are licensed or illegal that actually would be able to be long terms? Because a lot of the uh, homestay rentals really aren't able to be converted to long stay. Right? So well, does that make sense? Because if, if, you're, if you're saying that you're taking um, homes from people that basically would have been long term, and then you talk about homestays as being staying in the same house, using the same kitchen. So I don't, I'm sort of getting mixed up with um, the concept of how that affects the long-term rentals. Does that make sense? I think I think what Sage is saying, um, and you know, just maybe I'll enter. I think what her concern is is if you know you've got these. Um, historically, you know, what we have been long-term rentals, you know, their basement apartments or whatever. Um, and they're, and now, um, now they kind of have to stay long-term rentals because they have a kitchen in them and therefore, um, you can't make them short-term. And so she's saying that if, if you're allowing the full-blown kitchen to remain in there, then maybe some of these, um, you know, basement apartments, that mother-in-law suites, now they're going to take, they're going to no longer be long-term rentals because we're allowing them to be short-term rentals. I think that's what she's, she's concerned okay. about losing, you know, what, you know, small apartments right now that are under the same roof. She's concerned about losing that to short-term. Unless... It's, it's, a good way. it's a great way. I'm worried about our long-term housing stock affordability and the cost at which it, it is to replace it. We just don't have it. We, yeah. So, um, Shannon, uh, uh, well, so before, before we take a, okay, so is whatever <laughs> we've talked about as a committee, is that moderately clear? What, so what I, I guess I, let me let me let me ask a question. So we've talked about three separate issues, and then we've said there's these minor things, right? So what we're hearing is the concern around the kitchen definition change. That that it may be that making it too too easy will open up people. So I, I'm hearing that there's not agreement on moving that part forward. The part with the co-hosting. I will tell you from a staff perspective, we know that there are folks who come in and buy up several of these who don't even live here. Uh, we had hoped that by allowing co-hosting and putting in the one natural person, that that could no longer happen. So I will tell you that the reason we recommended that is because in talking with Brad, um, and I may ask him to chime in, that that meant that you wouldn't have people in California buying up properties, several properties, and driving the market rate up in the area. So I will tell you that was our recommendation for recommending the co-hosting so we know exactly who's managing it, and the same person is managing it on the website. Um, it sounds to me like I, I'm questioning this from what you all are saying. You all are fine with the detached not being allowed to be a homestay. Okay. That part of the ordinance, as well as the minor changes, you're okay with. Is that correct? Like 18 years old and changing things. Yeah. The little word change in compliance 160D, that all seems 
pretty simple. But but now, do we have consensus around the um, the residential manager and the owner thing? I would think it as a worry, y'all. I really would because I think. We Again, shouldn't. the enforcement, if one person yeah. can't come up and buy five and have five yeah. different renters managing it, it will happen. Yeah. If it's happening, it's already I mean, But, but yeah. Brad's saying that we can, I mean, if we require that they they register the owner of it and they, that, um, I think what I heard was that we can enforce that. Well, that's we why I asked about run. hiding under I, LMPs, because I think, I think you can. Why can't we just say it's not allowed? I mean, because homestay is, it's taking away what homestay means if you're allowing, you know. Well, that's what they're asking us. Should we allow it? I just don't think so. Yeah. So, so Sandra, you're of the opinion, I mean, just to ask. So you say that, like, if, if I'm a renter and I'm renting a home, um, I can't have a homestay because it has to be the owner. Okay, that that's I think the goal we're trying to get to, right? So the renter can participate in this because it's an okay. equity issue. Okay. Because the homeowner okay. shouldn't be the only ones able to play. I get that. Yes. However, how to enforce it in a way that doesn't it's it's the same thing over and over. We're trying to make something easy for good-hearted people with good intentions but on the other side we know there's a bunch of other people with bad intentions that will take advantage of it so we have to be smarter we have to figure out it, it probably seems like airbnb you know helping with enforcement how do we make sure that only one person one renter yeah 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 because yeah. i'm thinking you can be you can be a part of multiple llc's and you can't always find them i know that from having to search up properties and try and find owners but hopefully, but hopefully the software that they have, I bet they could probably do it easier. I bet some of the software. I don't know, but I think, you know, there's a lot of cities that are harping on these short-term rentals. There's some cities we can look to that opened them up, you know, and we can look at Portland, we can look out in California and Washington, and we can see good and bad. And I think we can see why a lot of cities haven't followed suit. Um, if it's, maybe there, maybe we should, go back to the drawing board on this particular item and maybe I don't think what I'm hearing is y'all aren't concerned necessarily about us trying to limit the number of investors you're more concerned about the owners participating in the management of the homestay because those are the two that's well, the I'm concerned with limiting the investors same that's what I'm concerned with yeah wait but wait are you concerned because you don't think we can figure it out I'm concerned that the current state, we can't prevent it from happening. And if you have anybody that's selling a house or a piece of land right now, you know it's all cash buyers from out yes. of state. And I don't want them coming in. And, and they ask the same thing. I date a realtor. They ask the same thing every time. Can it be a short-term rental? Yeah. Yeah. And no, and I agree. Go ahead. But just and to I clarify, agree. we're... I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. <laughs> no, anyway, and I'm in agreement with that because like she said, it's... What happened years ago when I was doing real estate, and I, of course, deal with a lot of real estate that's in the gentrification areas, and what was happening, every house I put on the market was being bought up cash like this, and they were that was when they were doing the short-term rentals. So now we're finding that same type of pattern being used in home states. So we have to find some kind of way to control it. And, and when city council came out basically and said, no, no longer we're going to allow uh, short-term rentals within the city or whatever, it did die. It died within the city. So I'm saying we need to sort of maybe come up with some ideas to sort of stop the investor from coming in, uh, uh, actually, you know, uh, taking advantage of the homestays for the people. That's that what I was trying to ask. Yeah. Um, thank you for saying that. So I, I'm just trying to say, I think you all agree that we want to try to limit, if we can, limit how investors buy up properties and use them for mm -hmm. homestays because that is happening today. Yeah. That happens now. You, you're you okay with trying to control that if we can figure out a way to do that. So what we're proposing is a way to do it, not using Airbnb because we're not sure we can count on them participating. So we're trying to find another way for us to try to control for this. And um, so I'm just not clear on if you just don't think the way we're doing it is right, or or is your concern that it gives the owner the opportunity to kind of like 
um, be out in the open with ma helping to manage that homestay? Well, I'll back up to say I think staff have done an enormous amount of work, and I greatly appreciate the many years y'all have done into this. So I don't think you're doing anything wrong or incorrectly. I think we're all just trying to brainstorm the best path forward. Um, so I think until we, I guess we need clarification on can you always find an owner of an LLC? Because I don't think that you necessarily can. Nothing, nothing on you, Brad. I just I feel like I'm searching for LLC sometimes, and I can never find the owner. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing, but I, I'm just not convinced that's the one thing that's going to make it all work. Um, but so, so I'm hearing you support that, but you just want a little like let's explore this a little bit more. How is it going to work? How's it? Yeah, um, yeah. How to really yeah. you know safeguards in place? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so maybe we, we put a pin on that one. We yeah. revisit that or explore that further. Can I just also clarify, are you guys okay with us making at least that little change to the, the weird dimensions about the sink and just clarify like this is, you, you can have a utility sink in your utility area, but we're just gonna- I'm not, I'm not okay with that. Well, because right now what's happening is that they are, some people are putting sinks in their home yes. states because of the way the definition is written. So I'm just trying to, I just want to close yeah. that loophole. That's I would support not having the sink in the kitchen. That's and what I'm trying to say. That's yeah. what I'm trying to say. I understand. Is to not have the sink, but, you know, make that really clear that you're not supposed to have the sink because right now it's not. And, and even, yeah. 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 Okay. Where, where are you on that? Where are the others? Yeah, well, I'm not really, like I said, I'm not really opposed uh, to the sink. I, I'm more or less opposed to the uh, full-size stoves and refrigerators. Uh, I think with the sink, like I said, in light of, because I think, especially with this COVID thing, I think you'll find more people feeling more comfortable, you know, staying in these spaces. And I think you just need a sink for just safety reasons, uh, or just a lot of uh, sanitation uh, and things like that. Because even if you have a microwave, or you have, you know, you bring food in, you may need somewhere to, you know, I, I, I think a sink is, to me, it's not that. I, mean, so, so point, Sandra, I would wonder, you know, in the beginning, what happened, and Shannon, maybe I'll speak to this, when in the beginning, what happened with enforcement was people would apply, they would roll their oven and the refrigerator out the door, hide it, get the permit, roll it back in. So the thing, why it got attached to the sink is because the sink can't be rolled out of the house. So the sink can't be pulled temporarily and put back as easily as an oven or a fridge. And I mean, people were frankly very open at P and Z. I remember them saying, I'll just move it out the door. You'll be gone, you can't come back. I mean, okay, but the thing is this. So we're going back to rules and regulations that we need to put in place because it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen regardless, okay? So I'm saying that what we really need to start working on is trying to put in an enforcement rules and regulations and getting some type of uh, 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 people together that actually work to actually make sure we uh, we enforce these rules and regulations. And once you enforce these rules and regulations and you've got hefty penalties on them, then, and that's what I think, that's the route I think we need to go. I mean, for me, because... Um, well, from an enforcement standpoint, it is much easier to say you can't have a sink. Um, because as Councilwoman Turner has said, it's you can easily remove a refrigerator or a even a stove much more easily than you can the sink. Yeah, that's true. Um, and if it is helpful, just to remind the council members that um, these individuals, the, the guests, do have access to a sink. They typically have a private bathroom, and if they don't have a private bathroom, then they're in the main house sharing a bathroom and a kitchen. So just, I think, um, I believe it was Councilwoman Turner had mentioned earlier that all of these homestay guests in theory should have access to the main kitchen. Um, that's kind of up to the homestay owner to decide if they wanna share their kitchen you know, with the guests and some do and some don't. And I think it's those who kind of wanna preserve the privacy and the sanctity of their dwelling unit that they are trying to offer full amenities in the private living space that's being used as a homestay. And I think um, what I'm hearing is that we want to try to preserve those spaces or we don't want to make it easy for people to convert those fully equipped living areas, long-term living areas into homestays. And I wonder if we could be supportive with the homestays and talking about bigger bathroom sinks or anything. I mean, I just have a big barn sink. It's kind of in style. 
It's, it's, I mean, it's not the um, size of the sink, really. That it's the a bathroom I mean, sink. Yeah, a bathroom I just mean, sink by definition has a, a certain size diameter um, drain. And a I just mean helping folks to understand they can be creative with their bathrooms to uh, to have a sink that can wash dishes or something. Sage, yeah. Sage, can uh -huh. I can I just ask you to let Shannon finish her sentences? I'm just. Uh, it's yeah the, the the a lavatory sink by building code standards has a small diameter drain, um, and a kitchen sink has a larger diameter drain. So if you're going to wash dishes and things, you need that larger diameter drain, um, because that that's the complaint that we've heard from a lot of or not a lot, but some of the homestay um, network folks is that, you know, people because they still cook in their microwave or that toaster oven. They go and they, you know, try to wash in the bathroom, and it creates a problem because that sink is not designed to to accommodate that. Um, so, and if if building code reviews an application with a sink like that, they're going to say, "Well, that's a kitchen sink." So then we're back to um, them meeting yeah, the they, definition okay. of kitchen. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Sage. Well, Sage, you got an illegal sink in your house. <laughs> no, I just have a strainer in it. <laughs> I just have a strainer in the sink, and, and I have rules for the guests to make sure things don't go down there. But I, you know, maybe I'm just too simplistic about it all and really protective of our affordable housing, and I've probably done enough talking, and I'm sorry if I interrupted you several times, Shannon. Oh, it's fine. It's, um, you know, this is a tough one. It's just really tough. Um, it's hard to navigate. It's a difficult thing to enforce. It's difficult to monitor. It's, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'm not surprised that there's some, um, you know, some some uncertainty about it. So I like our intentions, though. We want renters to be able to participate. You know, we want to protect our long-term housing, and we want enforcement around people that are doing it correctly. I think we have the right intentions, and we're all, we're all struggling with the fact that the platforms and the way to get there are not quite fluid. And it's really because of these big entities preventing working together. Sandra, do you have anything more? Okay, I'm going to open it up to public comment before we take a vote. So, staff, do we have anyone in the queue for public comment? There's no one in the queue. Okay. All right. So, um, can someone make a motion articulating where we are? Or maybe we can ask Shannon to make that motion and one of us can back her up on that. <laughs> so what I heard was a recommendation to move forward with the minor um, revisions in addition to the revision regarding detached accessory structures and prohibiting their use as homestays and grandfathering the ones that are existing. And uh, I, I think I heard to clarify um, that sinks aren't permitted. I mean, they that was the intent of the definition that's in place now, but there's just a funny little loophole and we want to close that loophole. Up, oh, Sandra, you're muted. Sandra, you're muted. Could, um, are we going to say anything about the investor, uh, how we deal with the investors? Oh, I, I meant to say, and we'll come back maybe with some more analysis and thought about that piece. Okay. Um, okay. I think those, that motion criteria was fine. I'd also request we try and come up with a way to establish how many units we might be putting at risk if this move forward, or maybe if that's, I guess we don't have to if it's not going to council quite yet. But if the kitchen thing starts coming back and ready for council, I really want us to have some more data on who we'd be impacting, not just who we'd be helping. Um, but I well, think moving forward, minor revisions, removing accessory or detached structures was the two we did agree on. But then does the motion need to include removing sinks as an option? No, because that's how it sits right now. Right, Shannon? I, I had just proposed to close the loophole that's allowing some very unusually shaped custom-made sinks. Right. Okay, um, so you'll take that out. Okay. Yeah. I'll make a motion. And Chris, do you have a sense in response to Councilwoman Turner's question and, and, and Councilwoman Kilgore's question about, is there any way to um, 
have a sense of inventory about these units that are currently long-term rentals that could possibly, I'm, I, do we have a way to know that? So I, I think what I kind of heard was like finding out um, how much housing stock we could be affecting or how much potential housing stock we could be affecting through that. And I want to tell you that's really easy to find, um, okay. but it's it's not because um, we're talking about, you know, ancillary basement spaces that may or may not be rented and, you know, things of that nature. Well, oh, the last day. time. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. The last time we talked about this, Chris, you know, normally you'd think that we'd be able to look at real estate records, but it's not always documented that there's, you know, that things have been converted to basement units or whatever. And, yeah. and, yeah, you know, yeah. unless there's a reason why it's the county doesn't go in and relook at a home. But so, most, most of these are considered part of the home. Almost all of them. Report. Does it talk to this at all? No, I mean not 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 this granular. It doesn't break that. Well, we do know. Yeah, I mean maybe this is where the, this is the task, right? Like in asking y'all to investigate this because we do know. Um, I mean, we get data around how many people own their homes. We know how many white people own their homes and how many black people own their homes. We know, you know. So if we have those numbers, then should we assume the rest are rentals? I mean, Chris, could get, we, um, can you run a report on, I'm trying to think if there's, I guess, I don't know how we would do this, running a report on Excella for the number of like basement renovations. That's not an accurate number, but it well, might give us a ballpark sense. Let me say this, anything we find is gonna be a little fuzzy because um, we're not gonna catch everything, but we can try. Um, to come up with something that'll give a, a sense, at least, of um, using for, certain keywords, maybe. Yeah. Um, the problem is they're not multi-family units yet, so we can't look and see if someone created an ADU, then we know for sure, and then they're not currently allowed to run it as a homestay. Um, so, but these are areas that you know could become an ADU, but no one's done the work to do to take them there. So, um, yeah. And doesn't have to be an ADU, right? Like allowing a kitchen would allow an apartment in a carpet complex to be a mm -hmm. homestay. I mean, it's just wide open then. So it's essentially any rental we have in the entire city of Asheville would be subject to this. It's just a matter of how many rentals do we have and do we know? It seems like a pretty big number. We um, know how many rentals we have. Right. Um, yeah, I don't think that's the question, Sage. But, I think but that question. would not, yeah, that would not identify these private living spaces that are already included inside. No, no, but, okay, that's true. Right. I mean, it, we're still not allowing whole dwelling rent, uh, short-term rentals. We're trying I mean, to. Right. But, I mean, it's not legal. Um, uh so it wouldn't be every rental unit in the city that that we are permitting. Well, um, it would only be if there's a if <laughs> if there's two families or two units under the same roof. Well, I hate to be the devil's advocate and assume that people will do the worst thing, but there are people that will take advantage of a system. So imagine that you're an apartment complex and. Um, the owner has granted you the right to have the rental and or to use your rental as a homestay. And then you just leave your rental and you live somewhere else. The rental is now, it will happen though. That's the thing. But, but, I'm not trying but to, like, this change in the rule is not going to make it happen any more than it already happens. Not here today. It sounds like what we're talking about in this oh, motion so is something I mean, that you're trying to get to. Right. So right, as far as but, the motion, I could make a motion right now. I think Shannon was asking, how can we get to this request? And that's different. Right. We got a little derailed. I'll make a motion if it helps. Okay. I would move right. that we move forward to council this um, homestay revision ordinances with only the minor revisions to come in compliance with 160D, little things like um, as Tuck mentioned, around 18 years old, older. Um, that we remove accessory and detached structures from being allowed as a homestay. And I think that's... And we clarify that... 
and we disallow sinks within the homestay. And then non bathroom sinks. <laughs> they should they're allowed to have ba- sinks, right? No, no, no nice. sinks. Yes, no, 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 no kitchen sinks. sinks. Sorry, no kitchen thank sinks. you. Clean that up as needed. That's <laughs> okay. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, great. So I'm gonna go through the roll call. Um so Councilwoman Turner. Hi. And I'm an I, and Councilwoman Kilgore? Hi. Okay, great. All right. Um, so I'm going to open this up for general public comment. Staff, do we have anybody who just wants to talk to us about other things? There's no one in the queue. Okay. Thank you very much. So with that, I'll adjourn. Thanks Thank for being you. with me, ladies. Have a good day. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you very much.